Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Well, hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach, and today we have with us John Paul Morosi. John Paul is a pioneer in the field of aging and caregiving and work balance, and he's been inspired by insights that he gained by arranging care for his own father. John Paul wrote the groundbreaking book on caregiving and balance called A Manager's Guide to Elder Care and Work back in 1999, and since then, he's helped employers around the United States and thousands of individuals individuals reduce productivity losses related to caregiving and work conflicts. And now he's just released the Caregiver's Work series book one called Caregiver's Work, a six-step guide to balancing work and family, elder care edition. John Paul, welcome to the program. Great to be here, Mike. Hey, so uh, with that little brief background, that kind of gives us a little bit of a timeline of you and, and some of your work and focus, and it's such an important work, not only from the content that we just talked about, but mainly from where you came from, why you started this with caring for your dad. So give us a little bit of background on Caregiver's Work LLC, and, and what are you doing currently helping your clients? What is the focus of Caregiver's Work? Now, Caregiver's Work is, exists to help employers reduce or minimize productivity losses regarding to um, the caregiver work challenges that their employees are feeling. And basically what we do is prov- we empower the employee to solve their own problem, but we also work with employers to make the changes they need to make in their corporate culture and in tweaking and better communicating their benefits so that the employee can stay engaged, stay involved, and most importantly, avoid the very costly turnover that no company can afford in today's ever-tightening labor market. Yeah, you know, when you think about, well, what's in it for me? You know, everybody uh, selfishly thinks, well, why do I care about this thing, whatever we're talking about? And so as you're explaining that, as if I were an employer, I would be thinking, what's in it for me or what are the advantages? But you hit upon one, one really uh, big one is that, that turnover. So we, I know that we don't have numbers or stats on the cost of turnover, but I have uh, interviewed people in HR over the years, and I know that that is a really big thing. Tell us a little bit about from your perspective, what turnover means and how you can help lessen that for an employer? Well, what's happening today, Mike, is um, every employer, regardless of the industry that they're in, is facing an unprecedented situation in society and in the economy. There are two unstoppable trends that are present today. One is the increasing participation of women in the workforce. Between now and the middle of this century, we're going to see the increase in the number of women over 45 years old in the workforce increasing by 40 million people. And these are the people who are directly involved in child care, elder care, caring for a disabled relative. The second unstoppable trend is the aging of the population. The U.S. Census Bureau just put out a report in the last couple of months that shows for the first time in American history, the number of persons over 65 years old is going to exceed the number of young people under 18. And the number of people with Alzheimer's, which is the most demanding population to receive care from family members, is going to be growing phenomenally in the next 10 years. So the the problem is here, It's not going away, and in many cases, employers' corporate cultures and their benefit packages are not matching the reality of what the vitally important female workforce is looking for in their work-life balance situation. You know, um, and again, I I don't want to go too deep on this one topic, but I don't also want to pass it by without, you know, a, a an employer that might be listening to this really realizing the true power of what you just said. In business and marketing, one of the main things we talk about is competitive advantage. What helps you stand out to be the obvious choice? So from an employer standpoint, one of the best things they can do to attract great talent in hiring is to have a great benefits package. Well, interestingly enough, some of the common things you would look at, you know, time off or salary or vacation or things like that. What if 
this uh, new uh, uh, elder care focus was a pretty shining part of their uh, benefits package, that would really make them stand out to attract some top talent, whether it's male or female, wouldn't you think? Well, that's a very good point, Mike. And as a matter of fact, there's a brand new report out by Harvard Business School called The Caring Company. And they did a statistically significant sampling of employers and employees around the country. And they found that employers misunderstand which benefits their employees value. And one of the most amazing things is the underutilized um, nature of the benefits that employers already have out there. For example, flexible work hours, only utilized by 39% of employees. Maternity leave only utilized by 28% of employees. And even personal time off only utilized by 55% of employees. So even the most basic benefits are underutilized. And this is part of what's contributing to many women in the prime working years, which happen to match up with the prime child care rearing years, are dropping out of the workforce. Because in the corporate culture, if it's not okay with your supervisor or your manager to make use of that flex time, to make use of that paid time off, you're not going to do it and you're going to remain silent and you're going to drop out of the workforce. Very costly for employers. I mean, the data is all out there in the Harvard report, which people can obtain for free. Um, uh, The link is available on our website at uh, www.caregiverswork.com. Um, we find that the employee is not hearing from the employer that it's okay to be engaged in this kind of activity of taking care of mom or dad, a child with a disability, a spouse who's disabled. That's got to change, uh, and the companies that make that change are going to be definitely in the forefront of keeping good employees and bringing in more talented employees, whether they be male or female. So, you know, I know that you've really got two groups of people that you uh, serve, which is the employer, which is what we're talking about so far, but also um, an individual, whether they're an employee or not. So let's uh, talk for just a second about how you help individuals with balancing their responsibilities of caregiving um, and work, because there's well, some yeah, really big... Very good that- point, Mike, cause, because there, we are here to uh, not only help employers to reduce in, the productivity losses and avoid turnover, but... The book itself is honed through conversations with hundreds of people who are involved in these caregiving situations. And essentially, it's a message of hope. Right on the cover, you see a a photograph of a beautiful cresting wave. And our message to the employee is you can find that balance. Just as a wave has a crest and a trough, the stresses of caregiver work balance can peak and then they drop off. The stresses are not uh, continuous. And by taking an organized approach, number one, taking care of yourself, finding out what the sources of your own personal balance are, and then following a very clearly laid out six-step process. And the workbook is full of easy-to-complete forms and checklists that help you get focused help you to understand the information you need to collect, how to communicate with your employer, your manager, how to engage the other family members to make it a group project to solve the problems regarding the elder care in this instance. Um, It really, and we've heard this hundreds of times now from uh, happy employees who've emailed us and called us back that this book has made a tremendous practical impact, positive impact in their ability to hold down their job and take care of mom or dad. Yeah. You know, I I think that any topic or concept that people talk about, there always are kind of, I don't know, misunderstandings. So what do you feel are some of the biggest maybe uh, myths or misconceptions when it comes from both perspectives we're talking about here, employers and individuals regarding maybe caregiving or productivity losses on or off the job? Well, and this is uh, confirmed by the Harvard study. Most employers do not regard this as a significant issue. It's just not on their radar screen. They're not aware of uh, what's happening with caregivers, and they're not aware of the impact that's happening in the workplace. Why? Well, in my opinion, part of the underlying reason is the age bias that we all live with in American society. 
we don't want to think about aging. We don't want to think about physical decline. And so we put it out of our minds. Think about the old, your own workplace. Um, when you gather around a water cooler, people are pretty happy talking about little Johnny or Janie's accomplishments on the soccer field. But how often do you hear anybody talking about the challenges of uh, change, becoming a representative payee for your father-in-law who is now um, – experiencing dementia or um, the difficulties of a caregiver worker not showing up that morning and uh, you're being afraid to leave mom or dad at home. It's not something that's considered part of the corporate culture. Or this is what's got talk. to shift. I'm sorry, what did you say, Mike? I said, or water cooler talk. <laughs> yeah, water cooler talk, exactly. Yeah. So um, that's part of it. Um, I would say that and a Harvard report uh, shows that a lot of employers are in denial about it, but that doesn't mean that they're not feeling the, the financial uh, impact of it. Now, from the employee point of view, there's a reluctance to talk about it. Um, one of the myths is that it's, it's an impossible task, um, that you can't find caregiver work balance, and that's why the essential message of my book is one of hope because I've experienced it myself. As a matter of fact, I'm going through it for the third time right now. Mm. I have an uncle where I had to play a tremendous long-distance uh, advocate role to finally get him out of a nursing facility where there were allegations of physical abuse against him. And we had, did succeed in putting the pieces together, myself, who I live in Colorado, my sister lives in Florida, but using the principles and techniques in my own book, <laughs> we were able to make it possible for Uncle Cy, my longtime fly fishing buddy, to get home, back into his own home, and put together the caregiving support, the home care support that he needs. And uh, it can be done. There are public resources out there. There are resources available from uh, the employer, but most employees don't have a framework for putting those pieces together. That's what the book helps people to do. Nice. You know, um, I was just thinking that from an employer's standpoint, they might really resonate with some of these things with the benefits and standing out and, and all that, but I think maybe the next thought that crosses their mind is what if, you know, what if I do this and something negative happens? So can you speak a little bit about some of the common fears that employers might face with maybe implementing some of these uh, um, ideas in their organization? You know, there's probably an unfounded fear that somehow by opening up uh, the conversation about what's going on in people's lives outside of work, um, that is going to cause complications, that is going to cause confusion. Well, I would say this, number one, the C-suite folks have got to walk the talk. Yeah. Corporate culture changes only when people start to act and talk like real, full human beings to the rest of the workforce. So if, uh, if our CFO can speak in a, in a top-level meeting about the fact that he's not going to be able to be there Thursday afternoon because he's got to go in person and solve a situation with an elderly relative in, a, in another city, that starts to set a climate for the managers below them uh, to say, you know, this is really going to be all right. We have a culture here that supports the whole person. And believe me, the loyalty and the enthusiasm that un unleashes in people, that they know that their company has their back, makes a huge difference in morale and loyalty to the company. So I, I can't overemphasize that. And you're, you're hitting on the right topic here, Mike. It's folks at the top. It's the yeah. leaders. It's the owners of the company. It's the CEO, the CFO, the COO, all the C-suite people. Um, if, they do, if they are not seen to walk the talk, we can put all the mission statements we up on the wall and have lots of great websites. Uh, but that sends, if they do not walk the talk, the middle managers are not going to make it possible for the line employees to have the flexibility they, use, they need and time Time flexibility is the number one need of caregivers in the workplace. You know, have you ever heard organizations that the C-suite will say, oh, I've got an open door policy and in a meeting, and then the employees go out going, yeah, open door, but boy, if I go in there and I mention something, I get swatted down, so I'm not going to go through that open door. Well, it made I was thinking about that as you were describing about the fears, because the next logical question is, how do you get past those fears? But you answered that by saying the C-suite needs to be open and transparent and open lines of communication. And what happens, I would say, and I want you to comment on this, 
this is let's say that uh, one of the executive C-suite is talking about their elder care challenges and some of the flexibilities and some of the benefits that they're taking advantage of. Word gets around to all of the under um, uh, the people in the underneath them very quickly that, hey, it's okay to take advantage of that benefit because Mr. Chief Executive Officer is as well or Ms. Chief Financial Officer is as well. Have you seen that in, in uh, play as well? There's no question about it. When that sends the message that it's okay, that it's normal to be involved in caregiving while holding down a job, and our employees need to hear that. Only, and, you know, this comes down to a very personal matter because I hope that, you know, some of the people listening to this will be the business owners and the CEOs. It's only when we establish harmony, love, and happiness within ourselves that we are in a position to really help our business. Yeah. Kind there of like may the be a uh, lot uh, of misunderstanding, attendance. frustration, and anger in the company. Directors, employers, and employees may be suffering. If you're not happy yeah. within yourself, if you're not feeling light enough, you can't run your business, company, or corporation happily and successfully. Yeah. This is a paradigm shift in what the workplace is becoming in the 21st century. And those who are stuck in the old mechanistic, complete separation between work and life, they're going to be lost in a new economy. And, and what you just said is so powerful because it's, it's kind of like the last time we took a flight and we hear the flight attendant saying, please put your oxygen mask on before helping those around you because if you're not taken care of, you can't help the child or the person sitting next to you. So, yeah, that's a really, really big point. Perfect analogy, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Hey, you know, um, I know you work with people individually and companies. Can you think of an example of uh, maybe without mentioning names or circumstances, but maybe where you've helped a client overcome some of these things? We're talking about obstacles or fears and help them work through this. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because I've worked with two major universities. And as you may know, there are certain industries where the average age of the employee is higher than others. Although I do want, I do want to emphasize this is as big an issue for millennials as it is for baby boomers, okay? Mm. But I worked at two large universities, and in both cases, they had an older-than-average age workforce, and um, they utilized my resources to train managers to overcome some of the myths and uh, uh, preconceptions that were getting in the way of them being truly supportive of their employees in the situation. And we also provided a uh, train-the-trainer session for some of their HR people so that they could take the workbook and provide workshops utilizing the workbook to give that extra level of support to people who uh, maybe not ready to sit down with the workbook all by themselves, but in a group setting, getting the benefit of a facilitated group of caregivers in the workplace uh, who are supporting each other in creating their plans for work-life balance. So we saw that roll out um, in a couple of these larger universities with thousands of copies of the books put into people's hands uh, and utilizing um, online resources as well. So um, it can be done. It all starts with the commitment to this philosophy of truly embracing work-life balance uh, from the top down. Yeah, yeah, that's really good. Thank you for that. And, and when you work with some big universities, that sure is a nice feather in your cap to say, you know what, it's not just, you know, this smaller name person or this small little teeny company. This is a major university that has taken on these uh, concepts. And, you know, talking uh, almost about fear, I know you work with companies as a consultant. What do you find that some of the obstacles are when you uh, are talking to a company or even an individual when they're thinking of bringing on someone like yourself to help them work through this? What do you finding that way a lot of people have preconceptions about consultants and yeah. you know so uh, I try not to I, I don't really talk about myself as a as a as a consultant I'm really a coach and a guide you know Mike I've, I had the good fortune through a long portion of my career to work with one of the most outstanding management consultants and his name was Alan Froman from and he was a graduate of the MIT, MIT Sloan School and I learned from Alan and, and observing him as a role model that a really effective consultant really only has to do two things. One is to truly care about the client, and not the company, but the individual that they're there to help. That my prime motivation, my only motivation, is to help my client to succeed in their business. So that's number one. Number two, to be honest. Um, my role as a coach and a guide in this caregiving work balance uh, sliver of the world is to help people 
to really hear the reality of what exists, not what they think exists in their company. And number three, I don't create dependency. So the, the third characteristic that I learned from Dr. Alan Froman um, is to give people the insight, the perspective, and the tools to continue to solve the problem, meet the challenges when I'm no longer there. So my goal is not to leave a, a report that collects dust on a shelf, but to change the framework uh, with which people approach an issue and give them the skills on an ongoing basis to be effective in, in uh, changing the workplace in the right direction. Yeah, that's so, that's so powerful. So what, what initially inspired you to kind of take on this work and work with companies and individuals, you know, in addition to working through with your dad, but a lot of people work through things with their parents and don't think, I need to take this on as my personal mission. Well, I was the president of a, of a trade association um, in the state of New Jersey at the time that my father took ill. And even though I had worked in this field of home care and elder care for 15 years at that point, um, I was astounded by how difficult it was to keep both feet on the ground, to keep being productive in my role, which was interacting with the state legislature and the media and uh, you know, putting together educational programs, which you do in a trade association. And at the same time, uh, doing what was necessary to help my father solve his housing problem, get the right medical specialists involved with his care, um, make sure that uh, my mom was coping with the changes that were going on. And I thought to myself, if I've been in this field of home care and elder care for 15 years, and this is very challenging to me, how is it for, for the person who has been in denial about aging, and number one, and number two, um, knows nothing about the basics of the whole elder care network, public programs, uh, the, how employee benefits relate to this area. And so that inspired me um, to take the step of writing my first book, and it was a conceptual framework for employers and business owners, and then move on to a very practical guide uh, which could help the individual employee. So it's been very rewarding. I, I think we're still at the infancy of this uh, issue coming to the forefront. There's been a lot of denial, um, but the, the, the unstoppable trends that I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation are making this an absolute necessity for success uh, in, in any business in our society in the years to come. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and like you said, it's, it's kind of like the tip of the iceberg. And when you mentioned those stats about um, the workforce, the number of people age 65 or older compared to 18, pretty staggering. Um, and so I think that, that it just uh, indicates that this, you know, I want to use the word problem, but really it's an opportunity. If you look at it from the perspective of an employer really serving and caring and providing empathy and expanded benefits, it is an opportunity. So if you're an employer, um, or even an individual thinking of uh, working with someone like yourself, what do you think some of the things that they should be considering when talking to someone like yourself? Like, um, you know, hey, I should evaluate if they have experience in, or what are some of the traits that they should be looking for? Well, there are a lot of people out there who are HR or benefits generalists. And so um, if, if any company or a leader listening to this wants to seriously uh, tackle the issue, you want to probe as to how much experience they have specifically in the area of caregiving knowledge, um, knowledge of aging, aging services, uh, the impact of stress on caregivers. And um, as a matter of fact, one of the easiest ways to put your foot in at the, <laughs> at the shallow end of the pool is to go to our, our website and you can get a free report, which we call the Blueprint for Balance, 10 Steps Every Employer can take right now to minimize productivity losses related to caregiver work conflicts. That report is available free as a PDF. Um, you, can, you can download it, print it out, look it over, hand it to your team, and actually start making some of these critical changes in small ways today. And so that's available for free at www.caregiverswork.com. Excellent. Hey, you know, you mentioned in your latest book that you, uh, a couple times in our conversation here that you focus on hope. What are a couple other key concepts that you talk about throughout the book? Well, the most important thing, uh, besides knowing that it is a possible task, is to take the time to assess the situation, learn about the resources that are available in the workplace and in the community, 
take a step back, weigh the options, then move toward implementing a plan, and then sticking with it. So those of you who are project managers or managers of any kind, probably hearing these steps, very similar to project management that's undertaken in a business situation. Well, it is true. Caregiving is, in a way, like running a small business with an extra dollop of human caring involved. So the six steps are start with that assessment, and it goes on through monitoring for changes and then adjusting the plan as you go along. You know, and I love uh, when you think about a checklist and you've used the word workbook and forms. uh, And so this is not just something that will go in one ear and not the other. It is something that will help guide someone through this process. So um, just let's wrap up with uh, what's the best way that people can pick up a copy of that book. And I know you've mentioned your website a couple times, so I'm confident that that's where the best place to start is. But but give us a couple other points of things that are on the website. Uh, Yes, you'll find out about the uh, worksheet that you'd mentioned and the book. What else will they be able to access on your website? Well, the website is going to be built out, but right now the core of it is you can obtain the book. Um, You can get the free report on Blueprint for Balance. You can get the copy of the comprehensive report that was recently put out by the Harvard Business School called The Caring Company. And we're establishing a forum, uh, which will be an ongoing uh, online communication tool for those who are dealing with this issue. Where we'll be highlighting best practices, um, new information, new research. It's going to become an online nas- national and international way to gather information and share best practices on avoiding these productivity losses related to caregiver work conflicts. Excellent. Well, John Paul, thank you so much for coming on today. It was wonderful hearing about this uh, really relevant topic, and I appreciate all your hard work. Thanks, Mike. appreciate you inviting me. Have a great day. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.